Welcome to Living Life. One of the big problems that I found in our youth and young adult at my church is that on Friday nights when we gather to have dinner and have fellowship, all the people were doing were watching their phones. They were completely dependent and glued and addicted to the device in front of them instead of actually engaging with the person in front of them. Therefore, I created this no phone policy that basically said that if I caught you using your phone or even watching your phone for whatever reason, later on that night, you would have to do a funny dance in front of everyone. People really didn't like that change. People didn't like the removal of freedom and the restrictions that came with this policy. And they certainly didn't like dancing in front of everybody. But over time, something changed. Over time, people got better at talking to the person in front of them. Over time, relationships started to grow. And over time, even when I was not there, people were enforcing the rule on their own. And that really showed me that there can be a development of respect for policies that are instituted in our communities. In our walk of faith and in our time here at church, there are lots of rules of what to do and what not to do. And we certainly have our own feelings and opinions about them. Our sinful nature is inherently opposed to God's will. But in today's passage in the story of Nehemiah, God shows us that we can grow, we can change to love, admire, and have a regard for God's instructions. Let us read today's passage together. Nehemiah 13, 10 to 22. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms, and made Hanan, son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. In those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys, together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads and they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same things, so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gate so that no one could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this, again I will arrest you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. We are at 
at the final portion of the story of Nehemiah. And by this point, God had graciously allowed the Israelites to restore the temple, the wall, and the city of Jerusalem. The Israelites were so convicted of their sin that they committed themselves to a new vow to God, basically summarizing something like this. We will no longer neglect the house of our God. Nehemiah took the assurance of their promise that they made to God, and he went away to do some business. And after some time, he returned. And when he returned, he found two things that really disturbed him and angered him. Number one, he found that the Levites were not given their portion that was assigned to them, meaning that the people were not actively and consistently giving their tithes to the temple. And number two, he found that the Levites and the musicians were sent back home, back to their fields, meaning that in the temple, in the church, there was nobody to conduct worship and lead praise. This angered Nehemiah so much that he flipped the temple upside down because he basically understood that the Israelites had neglected the house of their Lord, the very promise that they intended to keep. You know, when we make promises to God, we make them because we really want to keep them. When we make the promise to God that we're going to come to the prayer meeting before service on Sunday, we really want to be there. When we swear to God that we will sign up for the mission next year, we really want to go. But what happens on Sunday morning when the alarm rings? We snooze it and fall back asleep. What happens when the sign-ups for missions come out? We find 10 or 15 reasons as to why we can't go anymore. Why? Why do we fail to keep the promises that we made to God? Why do we disregard God's instructions that we signed up for? Nehemiah highlights another thing that he witnessed that really frustrated him when he returned. He found walking in the city of Jerusalem, people making wine, stacking of grain, and loading up donkeys to sell. Now, there's nothing wrong with making a lot of money, but the problem was that they were working and working very hard on the day of the Sabbath. This day, this holy day, was a day that they had committed themselves in the promise that they made to God that they would stop working. There was something about the Israelites where they continuously repeated their sin of desecrating the Sabbath day. And we have the same problem. We live in a fast-paced, profit-maximizing society where we believe that the goal of life is to reach a certain point in our careers and in our finances where we would be able to eat whatever we want to eat, build whatever we want to build, and live however way we want to live. We desire richness, we desire opulence, we desire wealth, we want to be self-sustaining. And we know that if we follow God's instructions to stop and to stop working, we will never reach our destination. Here's what I'm trying to say. The reason we disregard God's instructions is because we believe that there are obstacles that slow us down. We believe that there are stop signs that tell us to stop from getting to the place that we need to get to. Ultimately, we believe that God's instructions are not good for us and against our best interests. If we want to ever be faithful, if we ever want to keep our promises that we made to God, the very promises that we made to Him, we've got to change that thinking by asking this one question. How can we develop a high regard for God's instructions? Nehemiah does something important. After rebuking the officials, he storms to the gate of Jerusalem and he tells everybody to close the gates. He then picks certain guards and he places them at the border. And he makes sure that nobody is able to enter the city of Jerusalem starting from the night before the Sabbath until the day of Sabbath, ensuring that no more work would be be allowed in the city of Jerusalem. What is Nehemiah doing? In sports, coaches often try to teach their athletes how to shoot a basketball or how to hit a forehand drive by giving them a comprehensive list detailing every minute detail. But in reality, the best way to really change an athlete, the best way to help them grow is by allowing them to experience it. They have to feel the basketball rolling off of their fingers. They have to feel the ball hitting their racket. They have to hear the sound of their success. That eureka moment of experience is hardwired into their bodies so that they can reproduce the same results later on. Here's what I'm trying to say. Nehemiah 
wasn't trying to rain down a list of explanations for why they had to keep the Sabbath. He knew that they had already done that before and it wasn't working out. No, instead, by making sure that the gates were closed and putting guards, by enforcing the Sabbath, Nehemiah was really trying to create one successful Sabbath for the Israelites to experience because he believed in faith that if he could just get the Israelites to come and experience the first Sabbath, yes, it would be awkward. Yes, their sales might plummet a little bit. But if you could get them to the second Sabbath and the third Sabbath and the fifth Sabbath, eventually they would start to enjoy speaking to the person in front of them that they might really see that their businesses aren't doing too bad. And by the 10th and 20th Sabbath, Nehemiah believed that they would enjoy all the goodness that came out of the Sabbath. Because Nehemiah truly believed that God's Sabbath was created for us and not for him. God created uh, these, these instructions and rules and policies for our benefit. He believed that God's word was good for us. And ultimately, that there were a lot of joy that came out of his instructions. And once we experienced that joy, we would be able to develop a respect, reverence, and regard for God's instruction. We tend to only look at the negative things that come with God's rules, laws, commandments, and instructions. And when we hyper-focus on the negative things, that really pushes away from actually following and keeping the promises that we made to God. Instead, Nehemiah really teaches us that we have to look at the joys and the positive things that come out of God's instructions. Let me not explain it to you anymore. Go and experience the joy that comes out of God's instructions for yourself, with your own communities, with your own families. And with that, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word in Nehemiah today. We believe in faith that there is joy that comes out of your instructions. Help us to look at all the joy, all the goodness, and experience how good you are. And Lord, help us to rest, help us to keep your word, help us to fulfill our promise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. 